You've read the title, you've seen the thumbnail, let's just get into it. Hello my lovely friends, it's Margaret. Welcome or welcome back to the channel. Today I am going to be talking about some of the contemporary books that I have read recently. If you are new to the channel, hi, I'm Margaret and I don't do monthly wrap-ups anymore because they do not bring me joy. Instead, I've been doing wrap-ups based on genre, so when I read a little bit of a genre, I sit down and I talk about those books. For this video, I will be splitting general fiction from romance, so if you're looking for a particular one, timestamps will be down below in the description box. Also, if none of these books sound appealing because you are looking for an escape from real life rather than reading more about it, I did do a video about the recent sci-fi and fantasy that I have read. I'll have it linked up top and in the description box. Without further ado, let's talk about what I've read recently. We will start with general fiction and all of these are in the order that I read them. First book we are going to talk about is Vagabonds by Elosa Osunde. This is very much a slice of life book where we step into a period of time or period in the lives of various people who kind of live on the outskirts of society. The kind of central unifying theme is that all of these people live in Lagos. I ended up giving this four stars. I found the concept of it fascinating because we have on the one hand we have these people's just everyday lives as they are trying to deal with a society that is not necessarily welcoming of them. On top of all of that we have this really interesting plot line of like it's almost like the personification of Lagos as a city and the different forces that are acting upon people. The writing of this was just so deep and evocative and it had you the way that Asunde is able to take you through each of these characters, get you connected to them. She's able to pique your interest in these characters really quickly. She's able to form a sense of connection to these characters relatively quickly. Each one of them kind of makes you sit back and think about what what is society's role? What is a good society? It makes you sit down and and really grapple with the choices that these characters have made and look at them as choices that were made in the broader context of society. It's almost like a collection of short stories, but not quite. So I, I was able to take my time with this, which was nice. I really, really appreciated the glimpses into these characters' lives that we were getting. Next, we are going to talk about Cheetah Girls by Deborah Gregory. So I believe this is a middle grade contemporary. It's difficult to figure out because what was YA and what was middle grade were a lot closer when this was published. There's a lot of stuff that when like I was a kid would have been shelved in the teen section but a lot of reviewers consider it middle grade now and I'm not sure if that's like because of the length of the novel or or what's going on there but like there's a lot that I'm like I remember this and I remember this being in the middle grade section and this being in the teen section. Cheetah Girls was like on one of those little spinny racks that they had in our kids department right between the two sections. Based on how this one is written though I do think it fits probably more in the middle grade category. This includes the first four books of the series which are, hold on, I Wishing on a Star, Shop in the Name of Love, Who's About to Bounce, and Hey Ho Hollywood. This I picked up because it is part of an ongoing project where I am going back to books in my childhood where I either was explicitly told I was not allowed to read them or I did not bring home because I figured that would be what was told to me if my mom knew I was checking those books out. This is one of them. If you want my thoughts about all four of these books individually, linked up top, linked in the description box, like go check out the vlog that I did for this. As a whole, this got three stars from me. I had a good time reading it. I was invested in the characters. I was invested in the plot lines. I really like how Deborah Gregory was able to do as much as she was able to do in each of these four short stories, especially considering that every time we switch books, we are switching narrators. So each of these is from one of the five different girl, well, there's only four in here, but like each of the novels is written from the point of view of one of the five different characters. She does a fantastic job of setting these characters up right away, of setting up the conflict right away. I love the way that we have like a little mini sewed kind of conflict going on in each of these, and then there is an overarching kind of plot of these girls trying to become stars and trying to become singers that continues through. The main focus of these books is friendship. I like how she is looking at what it means to be a friend in this time in your life and what it means to have different goals from your friends and how do you balance like what you want with what the group wants. I do think that this is going to be great for the ages that it is meant for which is like the 9 to I think 14 kind of age range. It was not a book that was written for adults. It's not something that I think I will be picking up again. I'm going to actually be passing this along to a friend because she wants to read it as well. There are some things in here that do not age as well as they could have. I believe this was written in 96. Let's see if I'm right. 2004! Way off! I was so far off on that. Now that I think about it, it does feel very early 2000s. One of the things that I talk about in the vlog is that I am, there are a few things that I am unsure as to whether or not they are caricatures for the 
impact on the story because this is such a short amount of time that she has to get all of this information and make these impressions on you or if it was just maybe the author not handling that as well as she could have could be either one you will need to look up reviewers who are more knowledgeable the, at either of those things than I am for those answers I do not have them I will say one of the nice things about this series is that there is a, an explicit message that all bodies are beautiful that is not one of those early 2000s things that is in this book I was very nice to read and to recognize that the author was invested in supporting children with all body types and and showing all body types is valid that was really nice knowing how middle grade from this era quite often just contains a lot of inherent fan phobia. I would not necessarily recommend this to adults, but I think that it is great for the audience that it was intended for, and I think that it's got a lot of really good messages and lessons about friendship and about loving yourself and about confidence that I think would be great to pass on. The final just kind of general fiction that I read was The Thief Lord by Cornelia Funke. I will start by saying that while this is a middle grade contemporary, it does not feel like one. Like it is stated in the text that this book takes place at the time that it was written, which is I think about 1999-2000. I've been very wrong before. Let's let's see, am I right? We'll see if I'm right this time. Yeah, 2000. However, it feels historical. This feels like an old, almost detective noir type of novel. We are following Bo and Prosper. They have lost both their parents and been placed, well, Bo has been placed with their aunt. The aunt wants nothing to do with Prosper because he is too old. The boys wanting to stay together ran away to Venice because their mother told them stories about Venice and made it into like some sort of fairyland almost. They get caught up with a group of children who are living on the streets. They are thieves and they are led by this boy called the Thief Lord. The kids know him about for all of these ridiculous, impossible, crazy heists that he has done and he brings them some of the things that he got on the heist for them to sell. We're also following a private investigator who has been hired to find Bo specifically. Again, the aunt does not care about Prosper, just Bo. It is the, mm, the anger coming off of me every time this woman was on page. I will say it's a little bit of a Peter Pan retelling mixed with a little of Oliver Twist. Like both of those elements seem to be in there for me especially as you get closer to the end there's a little bit of a magical twist at the end however it's not magical enough that I would call this a fantasy because it's just like this one moment at the end the rest of it is these kids trying to plan this heist that they have been hired to go on and, and all of that I thought it was okay it's a book I read the whole like situation with Bo and Prosper and the I don't know how family services works across the pond. I just know that like based on my work with family services because I did do some work with them for three or so years like I mm, like the way that the entire situation with Bo and Prosper was being handled made me angry. I also like found it very odd that they are living the way they're living in 2000 in a city. Like some things made sense. Some things I was like you're sure you're sure we're not in like 1950. You're absolutely sure of that. That might just be my recollections of 2000 being a little bit skewed because I was a child at the time. There is a vlog where I discuss specifically what it was that was in here. It was, it's like, a, I don't remember if it's like a slur or just a bad offhand comment, um, but there is a vlog. I'll link it down below if you are interested in potentially having your kid read this. I would not recommend this for that reason, just because I think that there is fiction written today that had, like, you could probably find this plot without that flaw. I enjoyed the story. I liked getting to know the kids. I just, in a book written in 2000, I could see how the author would be ignorant to the fact that, like, that's not a great thing to have in your book without it being, you know, contradicted in some way. But also, there's bet there's stuff more recent that has that awareness that I would probably recommend over this. That's the most that I have to say about it. If you want more thoughts, please go check out the vlog. I don't remember specifically what it was, but I just, like, it did not leave a massive impression on me. It just was a book I was reading because it is on my TBR and I wanted to get it off of my TBR. Moving on to the portion that editing Margaret is going to hate, and that is the romance section. I only have one of these books physically. I'm mad about it. I'm mad about it now and I'm gonna be mad about it editing. We are going to start out with just basically, I guess, Talia Hibbert. The first two books that I am going to talk about are books in the series. We have The Fake Boyfriend Fiasco and The Princess Trap by Talia Hibbert. These are two books that are technically part of the same series, however there's no crossover between them and from what I understand 
there isn't any crossover in all three of the books in this series, they just kind of happen to be linked together in that. Starting with the fake boyfriend fiasco, I ended up giving this one three stars. This is a romance between Arya and Nick. Arya has been hurt by past romances. There's a whole situation that happens before this book starts that just really messes our main character up and she's like, I am no relationships, no relationships for me ever again. I cannot trust men. And then we have Nick and they have this like random meeting when he is trying to escape a fan or like an ex fling. Basically she's not taking no for an answer and he doesn't know how to say no and so Arya helps him out a little bit with that and sparks fly and he decides he has to date this woman and then he finds out that she does not want to date and he's like well what if I hired you to be my fake girlfriend. Holly was really able to sell me on the relationship building between Arya and Nick. I liked watching them get to interact. I also liked like because they're on this little vacation with all of his friends that's why she's fake dating him. It's always fun when you get to see like really nice full robust friend groups that are interacting with each other. It was really sweet to see the fact that even though his friends are all kind of paired off they all have their own people they're still like a tight-knit group. He is a soccer player I believe or a retired soccer player. There's some an element of fame and sports involved I don't entirely remember which point. This like had me up until the very end. This third act breakup like I understood it. However, just the way the third act breakup went down, I couldn't see her getting back with Nick. Obviously it's a romance, that is the point, that's what's going to happen, but like there just was like stuff that went down that I was like, I don't, I like I was rooting for them and now I don't know how I feel about this. They were cute though so I will forgive it, it just, the last like little bit of this book was not as fun for me and I felt it was a little bit a little bit abrupt. I would have liked to see a little more of the process than we got. Moving on to the princess trap, we are following Cherry and Reuben. Reuben is a kind of like slightly disgraced prince that is dealing with the fact that his last relationship went bad in a way that ended up being very public. He is trying to kind of toe the line, he's trying to play it safe, he is trying to uh not cause scandal for the rest of his family again. There is a lot going on there with his brother plot points so I don't want to spoil it but just rage. I like how that resolved though so I don't have any complaints there. Cherry is working as an administrator at a school that Reuben is touring because he has a scholarship or some sort of grant that he is considering giving to that school. Fun fact, because Cherry is like, this school sucks, he doesn't do it, which is why you should treat your employees well. They hit it off, they make plans to go back to her place and have a good time, and then they get caught in the alley by a photographer, by a paparazzi who has recognized Reuben. Here's the thing, Reuben and the rest of the royal family from his country, which I don't remember, I think it's a fake country, I'm pretty sure it's like a Princess Mia of Genovia type situation. They have a deal with the paparazzi where the paparazzi are like they have final say over what photos go out. So to keep this picture of him and Cherry making out in the alley from getting out he's like no she's my fiance and then has to explain to Cherry that he has just accidentally engaged them. They strike a deal she's going to pretend to be his fiance for about a year and then they're going to break things off. It's a romance do I need to tell you how things go? There's so much going on here. I again Talia Hibbert knows how to build romance and tension between her two main characters. She just, she hits that out of the park every single time she does this. She had me so wrapped up in both Reuben and Cherry as characters and then them together. Like their interactions are so fun. Them trying to, especially as Cherry is trying to like putting together the pieces of like what happened to Reuben as a child. Like she, just watching her go through that process fantastic. Also one of my favorite things about this book is how the third act breakup is handled. I don't like I'm I don't want to say too much because I feel it will be spoilery. It's one of the best third act breakups that I've ever read. In my opinion like it was a like they were both mad they said some things in the moment and then they got out of the moment and they're like yeah that's a stupid reason to break up we should talk this out. And I loved that. I really, I really, really enjoyed that and the way that they kind of piece things back together. And then just the ending, I can't tell you the ending, uh, but it was fantastic. Big old trigger warnings for child abuse. There's a lot of both off screen and actually seen on on page. We don't actually see the moment, but we do see the after effects. So just go into it knowing that that is a significant plot point. I believe Talia does have some other triggers 
at the beginning of the book. She's really good about putting trigger warnings at the beginning of all of her books. So check those out as well. Uh, but I highly recommend it. I gave it four stars. I really enjoyed it. It was so good. If you thought we were done talking about Talia Hibbert, we are not because I also read Highly Suspicious and Unfairly Cute. A number of times when talking about this book over the last few months where I have tried to say Unfairly Suspicious and Highly Cute, um, it's not non-zero. In this one we're following Bradley and Celine. They were friends in elementary school and middle grade because they both were kind of for various reasons like considered the weird kid. I don't know that we ever get Celine's specific diagnosis but with Bradley we do know like it's stated on page Bradley has OCD and he has done the work he's he's gotten a handle on it he is working through it but when he was a child and no one knew, he and Celine kind of were like each other's safe space. When they hit middle school, Bradley's like, okay, I think I'm working on this. I think I can like be a normal kid now. And so he tries to go and make normal friends. And those normal friends kind of don't get along with Celine. Celine, rightfully, gets her feelings hurt, cuts Bradley out of her life, and then considers him her nemesis for the next like four, five years. I do not know how long it would take. This is set in England, so like absolutely not the terms that would be used for like where they are in there, but you get what I'm saying. Now we are at like 17, 18, 19? I don't remember. Basically they are nearing the end of their education and so Celine is trying to get into this wilderness program that will, it comes like it's a competition type thing, it comes with a scholarship. Bradley ends up accidentally breaking her wrist. And because he feels bad, he follows her to the, he's like, here, I'll drive you. I will make sure that you get there safe. Um, and then he's like, oh, there's a scholarship attached. This could make my life easier when I go off to uni. So basically this work book is work them as they are going through this wilderness program, working through the fact that they are both very hurt by what happened in the past. And also some feelings might be developing and like they miss each other more than they thought they did. It is just, it's, it's like this wonderful literary soup, delicious literary soup that has all of Margaret's favorite flavors. If you couldn't tell by now, this got four stars. I had such a good time reading it. I listened to this via audiobook, highly recommend. We have two different narrators for the two different points of view because we're following both Bradley and Celine as we go through this. I really liked what this had to say about mental health and people's mental health journeys. Both of them clearly have like their battles that they are fighting mentally for various different things. Um, Celine's kind of manifests in an obsession with conspiracy theories. Bradley's obviously is his OCD. We have one person prior to when they have sought treatment and one person who is currently actively seeking treatment. And I like the way that both of their storylines were handled. Talia Hibbert just did a really good job of communicating what it was like to be in both of their heads and communicating the different ways that they managed to cope and, and showing how that worked. I also just, I'm a sucker. I'm a sucker for some friends to lovers or ex-friends to rivals to lo friends to lovers. Like it's, it's, it's a, it's a journey to get there. But watching them kind of realize through interaction that they have both kind of changed, that the things that happened in the past maybe Maybe they didn't both have the same story. Riley definitely had some apologizing that he, he because he's a 12 year old boy when this happens and, and 12 year old boys, sometimes they're a little dumb. Sometimes they don't, they don't do the feelings the best. But I like watching them work through that, going from like, okay, maybe we'll call a truce to maybe we can be friends again to, oh shit, I'm into you. I enjoy those kinds of stories. Talia Hibbert also once again does a fantastic job with fleshing out our characters' families. Like just the way that she is able to do that and make characters that are not on screen or on page for a whole lot of time, make them into real characters that you do have a bit of a connection to. Love it. We have two different family situations going on here where Bradley, like his parents are still together, they're still happy and they're very supportive. And then he has an annoying younger brother, which relatable. Then we have Celine who's dealing with the fact that her parents are very divorced and her father does not, has not checked up on them. It does that. And the way that that particular plot line was handled just, I am in awe of how Talia was able to walk us through all of that and all of the things. It's not perfect, like what happens, but it just felt so real and authentic. After that, we need to talk about Son of a Beach by Mia Sosa. This is a very quick novella that I read for my project where I read 30 books in 30 days. Little bit of a crunch time there at the end. If you want more information on that, again, check the card, 
check check the description box down below. This is a quick two hour Audible original that Mia Sosa wrote. I've been looking at getting into some of Mia Sosa's writings and reading some of her stuff and this happened to come up as something I could get for free and so I pulled it up. We are following Naomi and Donovan. They both work for a magazine and they both separately have been pushing for the magazine to make certain changes. They do not get along. They are paired together to work on the magazine's annual swimsuit edition and neither of them, well, Naomi is not really happy about it. Donovan isn't happy about it for completely separate reasons from Naomi, but Naomi is just mad that she's having to babysit Donovan, which is basically what her job is, is to make sure that this photo shoot comes out correctly. Uh, obviously they're gonna hit it off, sparks are gonna fly while they are in these, this romantic beach tropical environment. Do not remember where they go, I know it is somewhere that is south of me. This was fun and cute. My one quibble with this is I just, like, if this had been a full-length novel, I think I would have enjoyed it a little bit more. The build from them hating each other's guts, or Naomi hating his guts, to them being like, okay, we should bone, like, just didn't, didn't quite compute for me personally. I was just like, I, I personally would need a little bit more time before I was at this point, but Okay. Donovan is a bit of a dick at the beginning, kind of messes things up a little bit, and then they both have to pick up the pieces through this, and I liked watching them work through that and try to do professionally. And then we did have a little bit of that, like, thing that I love where you're working with someone and your expectations or your idea of them ends up changing. I'm always a fan of that. Again, I just wish we had more of it and we had more time for this to develop. I also really like the resolution at the end of our novel, especially because I'm just, like, I am a sucker for romance novels where our main character goes into the novel with a specific, not necessarily trauma, but a specific thing that happened in their previous relationship that for them just wrecked them and you have the love interest come in and be like, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. The way that Mia Sosa handled it, again, can't say too much about it, but like I'm just a sucker for stories where the love interest is continually just like, nope, I'm gonna prove, I'm gonna prove you wrong. I am going to prove that that is not happening to you again, and I love it. The final book that we need to talk about is Something More by Jackie Kalilia. This is one that has a vlog. I'm not going to talk about it for too long. It is one that I did for the project that I did when Tortured Poets Department came out where I was reading Swifty authors. We are following Jessie in this. She has just been diagnosed with autism, and she is dealing with this diagnosis while also having to deal with the fact that she is going into high school. At the beginning of the school year, she makes a little list of things that she wants to do, one of which being that she wants to join the, be in the school play or join the drama club, which she can't do because she's a freshman and you have to be a sophomore, which again, as a theater major, that doesn't make sense to me, but okay, you do your school the way you wanna. We are following Jessie through like the gamut. She gets a full high school experience in one year of school. We're dealing with messy relationships. We are dealing with messy friendships. We're dealing with there's a love triangle involved, which I'm really happy with how that ended. I really like the way that she ends this book and, and, and all of that. I really liked the things that this book had to say, number one, about friendships and about what you should accept from friends, the way that it works or takes Jessie through her relationships with these very like these friends that are not perfect and her having to accept that they're not perfect and and kind of navigate okay but is this a sort of imperfect that I'm okay with and I can still build a relationship with these people with and they can still accept me or is this a sort of imperfect where maybe this is not a friendship I need to be pursuing and then we also have her navigating her first relationship and she I will say girl accepts a lot of things that if you would not accept, except when you are in your first relationship. This book is so, like, it's messy. Not, like, the writing, not the, the, the plot, but, like, in general, what's going on with Jessie is so messy. Jessie's not perfect, the people around her are not perfect. It's, it's such a good novel about people being imperfect. I also really enjoyed watching Jessie's journey of finally having a name for why, like, she just doesn't seem to fit in with other kids. And having her navigating her finding friends where she can still like sh be her authentic self that was my favorite part of the storyline is just watching her go through life and navigate life and just deal with hard things and finding the balance there that was so nice i also really love like there are some moments between her and her siblings especially like her and her brother where it just like the acceptance that she gets from her family or the acceptance that she gets from her siblings will say that. I think her parents struggle a little bit more, um, but 
from her siblings there is just such a beautiful wonderful acceptance that she gets highly recommend especially if you're someone who's like obsessed with 90s like music because Jessie is also obsessed with 90s music and I really like the way the author handled that I had a really fun time reading all of these books again if you are interested I will have my sci-fi fantasy wrap up up here thank you so much for watching if you enjoyed this video please give it a thumbs up that is it for now my friends I will see you later when we will talk about more wordy nerdy things bye